This session is part of a webinar series which aims to assist researchers, librarians and institutions in the adoption of digital tools and persistent identifiers for a significant increase of research discoverability globally and to increase efficiency in scholarly workflows. Details of how the recording will be shared will be also broadcasted after the meeting or during the meeting by Ebuka in the chat. He will drop some links to some resources, including online uh, social media pages, YouTube channels, and uh, and also the the Africa Archive uh, source pages where you can get to learn more about the, the project itself. Anyways, uh, without further ado, allow me to welcome everybody to this webinar. Thank you so much for making the time. Uh, we have got one hour. I believe that we'll be able to, to reach that target. We'll have a brief introduction, and then we'll pass it over to our presenters, of whom I will introduce during the introduction. We'll, we'll follow that up with a questions and answers section. And uh, please feel free to ask questions during that, that, uh, that session. You can just raise your hand. You'll be allowed to speak, or you can type it in the chat as the presenters are presenting. And, uh, and then we'll close off the, the webinar. So yes, this is the Africa Archive Open Science Webinar Series, uh, organized by Ubuntu Net Alliance and Access to Perspectives under the ORCID Global Participation Program. The webinar series is dedicated to exploring the transformative impact of persistent identifiers, that's PIDs. The aim is to highlight to the community of African scholarly stakeholders how selected scholarly services work to increase the discoverability of African research in the global scholarly landscape. The end game is an enhanced discoverability of African research. Thus far, we have and continue to dive into the significance of three key persistent identifiers as uh, OCIDs, IDs, uh, ROIs, and DOIs, and how they facilitate interoperability across various scholarly digital services to enhance African research discoverability. Today, we are joined by colleagues from the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative, that's COKI project, who will be talking about their major strategic multidisciplinary research project that combines data science with critical humanities perspectives and how they use open data sets to explore the openness of global research landscapes through different lenses. Uh, firstly, we have got Professor Lucy Montgomery, who is a world leading expert in open access, organizational sustainability, research cultures, and hidden impacts. She's currently the Dean of Research in the Faculty of Humanities at Curtin University and the co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, which is a major strategic research project exploring how big data can help universities to understand their performance as open knowledge institutions. She's not here alone. She's with her colleague, Dr. Catherine Napier, who is a data scientist who bridges the analytics gap in, tra in transdisciplinary research. She's currently the technical lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, leading a team of data scientists and software developers who work with leading experts in open access and square communication. Together, the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative team develops tools and infrastructure for navigating and tracking open access performance. So we are we are really in the presence of of some professionals here, and yeah, we we expect them to to deliver some some knowledge to us. Uh, but without further ado, uh, let me let me invite them to to make their presentation. So Catherine and Lucy, over to you. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I'll try my best uh, to live up to the high expectations. Um, but first of all, um, we would like to start by acknowledging the First Nations of the place that we call Australia, recognising the many nations who have looked after country for more than 60,000 years. Lucy and I are currently located at Curtin University in Bulu, which we call Perth, um, and this is located in Western Australia. It's 3 p.m. local time. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who has woken up early um, to join us at 9 a.m. Uh, we would like to pay our respects to elders past and present and custodians and owners of these lands, as well as those from all of the other nations who may be joining us from around the world today. 
So thank you so much for joining us, particularly if you are joining us first thing in the morning. We wanted to start with a bit of a background to the Koki project, uh, how and why it started and what we've been able to explore and research using open data sets. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm the technical leader of the Koki project, and I've been working with Lucy and Cameron and the, um, the Koki project team since mid-2021. Uh, mid uh, the story of how the Koki project started, um, it started several years before I joined the team. So I'd like to hand over to Lucy, who's going to tell us why the Koki project started, what lessons we might have learned along the way, and highlight some of our failures and some of our successes before I'll come back to talk to you about how we use open data to explore the openness of global research landscapes. Okay, cool. So thanks, Harold. Um, and yeah, that seems, um, I was sitting listening to that bio thinking that perhaps, um, yeah, I'm not sure who wrote my bio, but it, it makes me feel like there's a lot of pressure on us to be fantastic today. So we'll try not to disappoint too much. Um, and full disclosure, I probably wrote that bio at some point in my distant past when it felt like a good idea or something. So I'm sorry. Um, so my name's Lucy Montgomery. I'm a professor of knowledge innovation at Curtin University. And um, at the moment, I'm also the Dean of Research and Graduate Studies for the Faculty of Humanities. Um, but you know, my my role over the last few years since 2018 has actually been as co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. And I'm still co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative. It's just that at the moment I have a, a little bit less time while I'm stepping into the Dean role. Um, and in general, as Catherine mentioned, um, we started this project uh, in 2018 uh, with an amazing opportunity from Curtin University to do something that we felt was really important. Uh, and as a result of that opportunity and a really supportive Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research at Curtin, uh, who really uh, took us at our word when we said we think that we could do something really special with big data and persistent identifiers and new approaches to trying to understand the value that universities create in the world, Chris Moran. Um, we've had really generous support from Curtin uh, to, first of all, to explore a critical research agenda around uh, openness and the open role of universities in the world. What does that really mean? Uh, what would we need to think about measuring if we wanted to support a shift to greater openness for universities? Um, and, uh, you know, all of the spin-off uh, research questions that we can begin asking once we have access to really big, interesting data sets that relate to global research landscapes. So we had strategic funding from uh, Chris and as our Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research and the Research Office at Curtin University. And since 2018, we were discussing this briefly this morning when we were just reviewing these slides. Um, we've had more than $10 million in funding so far, uh, largely from Curtin, but also we work with external funders like Mellon and others. Um, and when we set up the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, I was at that time the director of the Centre for Culture and Technology. And we set this project up as a project that was very deliberately being led out of a Faculty of Humanities, uh, out of a Centre for Culture and Technology, and which was collaborating with um, the really deep data science and science engineering expertise that we have access to at Curtin because we're lucky enough to have the Curtin Institute for Data Science. So one of the big innovations that I was interested in with this project when we set it up um, was this idea that actually the humanities have got an incredible opportunity to collaborate and to begin working across disciplines and thinking about what um, new technological possibilities mean in terms of the way we make sense of the world, the stories we might want to tell about our institutions and the role of universities. So, yeah, so we're deeply collaborative and also very deliberately being led from the humanities as a data science project. Um, and 
the the sort of backstory behind how we came to have this amazing opportunity to set up really what's been my dream project um, was that Cameron Naylan and I had both arrived back in Australia at around the same time. Uh, we had both been working in Europe uh, on open access uh, publishing related projects. So Cameron had been the public advocacy director for PLOS and I had been uh, in the UK setting up Knowledge Unlatched, which is an open access program focused on scholarly books. And Cameron and I both came back to Australia. I had been away for about a decade. Cameron had been away for longer. And the first thing that really hit me as the director of a research centre in the Australian context was the incredible emphasis that was being placed on uh on rankings um, as evidence of why research was useful in universities. So for me, the moment of, oh, wow, there's something really wrong here came when I was at uh, an event being hosted by our university's vice chancellor, and she was talking to the research leaders of the university about the value that research was adding to our institution and to the world. And that entire value proposition was framed to us in terms of our university ranking. So in, in that narrative, researchers were valuable because we were helping to push Curtin up the global rankings for Times Higher Education and all of the other rankings that Australian universities are really obsessed by. Um, and... For us, you know, for me as as the director of a research centre that was full of academics who had really made a conscious choice to devote their um, life to research, I, I had a real moment of thinking, wow, you know, that, that's a horrible way to frame what we're actually adding to the world. Is that all we're doing? Or are we adding other types of value that perhaps are not being captured in these stories that the university is telling back to its own researchers about the value of the work that they do. Um, and sort of when we started pulling on that thread and really thinking through the problem, one of the things that became really quickly apparent to me was the challenge that senior leaders within Australian universities were facing when it came to making decisions um, about where to invest time or money or resources, and also about the pressure that they were under to, to be able to measure performance and to be able to make judgments that were based on hard numbers and which they could back up with evidence and, you know, this, this sort of sense that you really have to make sure that what's happening within universities is real, that researchers aren't faking the work that they're doing, that we have to defend our case for funding to governments. And a lot of that is numbers-based and a lot of the information that was being made available to senior leaders within the university um, was not perhaps relating to stories about value that, that universities are creating in the world. And there was nothing in that information that senior leaders had access to around openness and the openness of research communities and the work they were doing. Um, and for, for me and also for Cameron, that was a really bizarre place for the Australian conversation to be because at that same moment uh, internationally, the world and particularly Europe were making a huge push towards open science, open access, uh, Horizon Europe had announced um, open science as one of its research pillars. There was, you know, the establishment of the European Open Science Cloud had been um, signalled. There was all of this amazing, exciting work going on internationally around openness and Australia just wasn't in that conversation. So we pitched this idea for the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative in part because we wanted to intervene in that conversation. We were hoping that we could help uh, to support, I suppose, greater awareness of the value of openness at our own university. And we were also hoping that perhaps we could support a change in the conversation for all of Australia. And I think then quite selfishly, 
um, you know, we really, I didn't want to be working in research in a place that was just measuring the value of research in terms of university rankings by times higher education. Next slide. Um, so we uh, convinced Chris, we convinced the university that what we really needed was a, a research program that was going to make the most out of this amazing data science capacity that Curtin University has. And that we would, um, you know, start asking some really serious questions around openness as a research agenda that was combining humanities, uh, critical perspectives with the power of, of big data. Uh, and so the questions that we set out for ourselves as a research program um, were all focused around this concept of open knowledge. So we were thinking about open knowledge and universities, open knowledge institutions, as um, universities which were open in terms of the communities that were involved in making knowledge. So we were thinking about measures of diversity, community engagement, the involvement uh, of citizens in the knowledge production process uh, by universities, with universities, in collaboration with universities. And we were also thinking about the openness of the knowledge that was coming out of that process at the other end uh, in terms of, um, I guess, the standard measures of open science around open access, reproducibility, uh, FAIR, all of those other things. And we wanted to know what those open approaches really changed or what would they change if universities were to take them seriously and to start applying them. Um, we were interested in what, you know, what our dream university as an open knowledge institution could look like. Um, and as well as that, just from a practical point of view, because we were really hoping that the shift that we could support in universities would be something that would lead to real world change in the way universities were thinking about their value in Australia, we also set ourselves a goal of trying to understand what senior decision makers inside Australian universities would need access to um, and, and figuring out how we could capture that information and start making it available to vice chancellors who might, you know, really want to know whether the efforts that they were making to increase the openness of their institution were having a positive impact. So, yeah. So the first thing that we did um, when we uh, sort of set out with this project was to, um, to get a group together to sort of workshop this concept of open knowledge institutions with us. Um, and we, you know, wanted to kind of eat our own dog food, I think is the expression. So we wanted to live our values, I think is a better term. And um, to, to try and make sure that we had as many voices from and perspectives in the room as we could manage at the beginning of the project, uh, when we when we sat down to think about what openness means in the context of universities and research, and also, um, I guess, the changes that an open knowledge agenda could support within universities and the types of goals we might set ourselves. So the photos here of are of our first attempt to do that. We ran a book sprint or we worked with book sprints, the organisation, to lock a group of, um, a, it was a group that was as diverse as we could manage at that time. And we all got locked up with a facilitator, Faith Bosworth, uh, for a week. And uh, we, we spent the week working through the concept of open knowledge institutions. And at the end of that week, we had produced what was ultimately a manifesto for our research project. And it was also a theoretical framework that we wanted to be able to work through. Um, and that was great, but the people in the, in the room were still not quite as diverse as we might ultimately have dreamed they could be. Um, but, you know, we did a we did an okay job. So we had Cassidy Sugimoto was taking the, um, the selfie. She does a lot of work around bibliometrics. Um, she's quite well known. She's really done a lot of amazing work around gender um, and publishing using citation data and bibliometrics. We had Eve uh, Gray, who I, is in the photo as well. So she 
you know, we had a delegate from South Africa who was bringing a South African perspective to the conversation. And we also um, were thinking about disciplinary uh, diversity in our approach. So we had economists, we had people who came from um, area studies backgrounds, uh, and we had some amazing people like Catherine Skinner who work around open infrastructures. And we managed to get them into one room to workshop this concept with us. Um, and, you know, that was fantastic. But as I mentioned, you know, we were really conscious of all of the voices that we weren't able to get in the room for that, that initial kind of let's begin the process of thinking about what sorts of questions we might want to ask and how we might want to set this project up. So the next amazing opportunity that we had uh, with this project was actually to run a workshop at Curtin University's Mauritius campus, which hadn't been open for very long uh, when our project was established. And Curtin was looking for ways to encourage research collaborations between our Perth campus and the Mauritius campus. And we were given funding, again, by our amazing DVC for research to run a second workshop uh, in Mauritius. And that for us was hugely exciting because it meant that we were able to run the workshop in a different time zone and to, um, to sort of entice and to not just entice, but it made it practically possible and easy and affordable for us to include um, a wider group of people, including librarians from Africa. And we, at that workshop, uh, you can see in this photo, we've got Irina Kuchma, who works with uh, Eiffel, and she was able to bring access to her network of uh, African librarians and researchers who were interested in the sorts of questions we were asking. And we were able to then spend a week in Mauritius uh, working through what would we want if we were able to bring together all of the data in the world and we were able to link that data together and then to think about um, what we could do that is not just a boring old university ranking what would we be looking for and what would our design parameters be? So that was a really interesting event and, yeah, something that was hugely rich for us. Okay, so now I'm going to hand over to Catherine, um, who's going to show you um, what we built after we went and did all of that thinking, all of this wrestling with the idea that we hated rankings, but what we were hearing from some of our um, collaborators in the Mauritius workshop was that that they really needed access to something that was a little bit closer to a rankings, um, you know, tool. And so we came back to Australia and we, we spent a few years doing a whole bunch of data engineering work and thinking. And eventually, um, yeah, this is this is what we built. All right, so just making sure that everybody can hear me again. Thanks, Lucy. So, um, yeah, I want to take you through. Uh, want to take you through uh, an example of yeah, a, quite a powerful tool that we have built um, by linking you know large scale open data sets together. Um, this is the Koki Open Access Dashboard. It's a website that provides a subset of our wider data sets. Um, together in the form of a dynamic dashboard. I, everyone can go and explore this, open.koki.ac, and I will take you through a little bit of a tour uh, in a minute as well. We deliberately designed this website to operate in low bandwidth uh, settings. Um, I don't know about some other parts of the world, but uh, Curtin University doesn't have the greatest Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, the website also has better coverage than proprietary sources. And this is thanks to, you know, the really rich open data landscape and infrastructure sources that we've been able to work with and leverage from. So that's the teams at our research, um, Unpaywall, Open Alex, Crossref, uh, and the research organization registry, Raw. The dashboard might look a little bit, you know, fairly simple. Um, it's, we designed it to sort of try and have a really intuitive and sleek design. It has two tabs, country and institution. 
But the data that runs this dashboard when we really dig down into individual countries and institutions is incredibly rich. We've got data looking at open access performance for over 50,000 institutions and 225 countries. And this data set is updated monthly by our automated data engineering workflows. Research institutions and governments have been using this dashboard uh, to demonstrate the value of open access policies and to explore global research landscapes. So I will take you through a bit of a tour of the dashboard, but first I want to explain a little bit more about the open data sets uh, that we are using to power this dashboard. So because Koki started at a really good moment um, you know, of new technol technological possibility, we've been able to ride this wave of publicly and make publicly available uh, data infrastructures and data sets that have really allowed us to do some amazing things when we link them all together. The Koki team really wants to work with data and data infrastructures that are more diverse and inclusive than current commercially available data sets. And we've been able to engage with genuinely big data sets that relate to global research outputs. So we pull in data from Crossref, from Open Alex, from uh, Unpaywall, from Open Citations, uh, from RAW and from ORCID. Um, we stopped counting the number of data points a few years ago. Um, basically, we capture you know, quite a few data sources and we you know, uh, aggregate uh, and analyze the data in various ways. So we've got really rich and quite large data sets uh, sitting in our um, data lake. Um, counting big data is a little bit hard to do sometimes. We can talk about the terabytes of data that we process weekly. Um, we stopped counting at about 12 trillion data points um, from all sort of all the various sources uh, over time. But yeah, we're working with big data sets. And the way that we've been able to do this is because we've been able to tap into some really deep technical expertise from the data scientists and software engineers who are based within the Curtin Institute for Data Science. So we've been able to do some quite unique things in the space, working with scholarly experts like uh, Cameron, Lucy and Carl. So we've been able to scale up from working with CSV files and scripts. So we now use cloud-based automated data engineering pipelines. Uh, we ingest, process and analyze terabytes of data on a weekly basis. And because of this technical infrastructure that we've been able to develop, we can link or knit together these various large data sets from numerous sources. And we can really start to deeply explore the stories that this data can tell us about open access and scholarly communication. We do know that the data that we have isn't perfect, but we are crucially at a point where open data sets are better than the closed commercially available proprietary data sets. And we like open data sets because they're more transparent, they're more flexible. Um, we can link them together to suit local needs and to ask you know, the questions that matter in local contexts. Um, and note this uh, point in uh, 2023 uh, about the Africa Archive collaboration that we're gonna come back to as well. So by capturing uh, you know, all of this data from a wide range of sources and linking it together, we can then start to explore it through different lenses. So the open access website looks at institutions and countries, but we can also look at performance of funders, publishers, different groups and different collaborations. But it's also really important to note, given the theme of this webinar series as well, is that we're able to work with these large data sets at scale and link or knit them together because of the persistent identifiers that are used by these open research infrastructures. So we can link research publications with DOIs across the range of data sets. We can link authors uh, who are identified with ORCID IDs um, to research institutions with raw identifiers. And we know the data isn't always perfect, but these infrastructures also have mechanisms in place to correct the data as we identify issues. So working with the local communities who know their data is really crucial to the success, I think, of the overarching uh, open data landscape. Okay, so I'm just gonna take you on a little bit of a tour, a uh, brief tour of our open access website. So when you first come here, you're presented with the country dashboard. So we've got 225 countries. We're looking at open access uh, research performance um, from 2000 to 2023. Um, and you can also look at institutions as well. You can apply the filters here and look at different regions, which I think is pretty cool. So we can just have a look at all of the countries, for example, uh, that are contained within Africa, or you can search for individual countries and just go straight there and have a look as well. Uh, if you scroll down here, we've got 
couple of different pages, three pages of African countries here. Uh, you can apply um, sort of different sorting as well. So here we've just got the automatic default ranking, uh, not ranking, just order, uh, is the percentage of open access research outputs. Um, so you can also toggle that back and forth. Um, and you can also do the same and change the order of total publications or open publications. So you can start to take a look at some different countries in the region. So if I just click uh, on one country, let's just take a look at South Africa to start with. Um, each of the dashboards are laid out the same for each country and institution. Uh, you start off by having a look at um, some summary figures. So the percentage of research outputs from South Africa uh, that are open access is 55%. So this is from 2000 to 2023, um, 440,000 publications, 8.4 million citations. Uh, importantly, feedback that we got from our initial launch of the dashboard was that um, people really wanted to dig into the data behind the visualizations. So we've made the data available to download for every single country and institution. If you go to the data tab here, um, that's also quite big to work with. So we've also made it downloadable directly for individual countries and institutions by this download button here. So we tried to make this um, you know, nice and intuitive to work through. So you can start to take a look at the percentage of open access over time, the volume of open access over time, and then different breakdowns by the different types of open access categories. And um, we've also given some definitions um, of what we mean when we say open access journals or no guarantees and other platform open. Just gonna go back and we can start to take a look at an institution as well. So for institutions, we have this very similar filter. So we could look at all the institutions within the African region if we apply that filter there. Um, we can also look at institution type, which I think is really handy too. So let's just apply another filter just to have a look at the education institutions. And you can also have a look at all the institutions for individual countries as well. So you can select an individual country there. Um, but we can start to take a look at, let's have a look at a university over here. And one with a high number of uh, open publications. If we look at the University of Cape Town. So again, similar structure to the country dashboard, but this is specifically showing research outputs um, that have come from uh, this particular university. So let's scroll down here. Now I mentioned a little bit earlier about the um, you know the fact that the uh, open data infrastructures and data sources that you know power this dashboard have the ability to um, have mechanisms in place to be able to correct data upstream. So we don't know what we can't see. So it's really important for us to engage with people who know the data and know the data sources. So as people have been using the dashboard, we've been finding that some people have been coming and saying oh, look, the institution repository that we have, it's a little bit weird. There's two names or it looks duplicated um, and that looks a little bit strange. We've been able to go back and interrogate our data and take a look and go, oh, okay, we see what the issue is. We can report that to one paywall and then it then gets corrected upstream. Then the corrected data flows back down into our dashboard. Same thing with affiliations that are tagged um, by Open Alex. We've had people look at different institutions and go, well, actually, we think um, the number of total number of research outputs for our institution is a little bit lower than we'd expect. And we found this other institution here where we think they might be being tagged to incorrectly. We've been able to do a quick analysis, take a look, go, yes, indeed, you're correct. Thanks for identifying that. We've reported it back to Open Alex, And again, it's corrected upstream. So I just think that's a really powerful way for us to continually improve you know, the data and the open research uh, landscape in general. So going back to um, community engagement as well. So we've built this dashboard. Um, you know, we've taken on the feedback that have come out from several uh, books, book sprints and workshops, um, feedback from users as I started to use the dashboard. We deliberately designed the dashboard so it could be used by a wide sort of variety of users, particularly in low bandwidth settings. Uh, and then we actually started to look at things like, are people actually widely using the dashboard? So this shows the viewers for the first year of the open access dashboard um, uh, from February, 2022 to February, 2023. The darker purple colors here are where we're getting the most viewers. So we're getting a lot from Australia, which is not surprising because it's where we are and a lot from the US. But what about the rest of the world? Uh, getting particularly for the African continent, very low numbers of viewers. Um, and I think we only had viewers from 15 or so different countries. So in March, 2023, Lucy happened to present at an OWASPA webinar 
um, where Joe Haberman got in contact and went, this is really great. Can we embed the open access dashboards uh, for you know various African countries into Africa Archive? And we went, yeah, that's amazing. And the Africa Archive team was so proactive and so quick that they did this within a matter of, I think, a week, um, which is absolutely amazing. So if you go to the country profiles on the Africa Archive page, you can actually see our Koki dashboards for each country uh, embedded into those country profiles. And we began to immediately see the impact of this collaboration with Africa Archive. So we've now got the viewers from March 2023 to March 2024. Um, Africa Archive is our fourth biggest source of viewers, um, which is absolutely fantastic. We still have a little bit to do to increase viewership, but we've doubled the number of countries, um, about 30 uh, different countries from the continent now where people are actually seeing the dashboard. So we know that we can do better. Um, we can see publications from African countries and institutions on our dashboards, but you know we're not experts in the local context, so we don't know what's missing and what looks incorrect. If we can all continue to work together, we can continue to improve the open access and open data infrastructures that are able to provide such a rich landscape where we can really start to, you know, look into global open access performance, you know, from multi institutions and countries from around the world. So I'd love it if um, anyone today, you know, would take a look at the dashboard, take a look at institution. Can you find any issues with your data? Because honestly, report it to us because we would love to know. <laughs> So um, I'm very keen. I hope there's uh, lots of questions coming through. Uh, we'd just like to thank the various partners, funders and collaborators that we've been, you know, had the real fortunate opportunity to work with on real diversity of projects uh, over the years. And I think if we open it up to questions, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. Catherine and, uh, and Lucy. Wow, just wow. What a, what a platform, what a, what a dashboard so so impressive and so impactful um i believe that so many people have learned today and you know their eyes have been opened to to this platform and um yeah i'm glad that it has happened on, a, on an african on an african you know webinar webinar that's that's attended by mostly africans so hopefully that's going to raise the the views and <laughs> and also the, the awareness of it but yes we have got one question in the question and answer section by Valentine Banda. So he says, when putting the countries in order or ranking, what criteria do you use? Okay, I might just go back to the dashboard here. Let's go have a look at home. Um, so in terms of pulling in countries, actually, I've got the how it works uh, section just showing here. Um, sorry, I've also got the Q&A open up on my screen, so just trying to shut that down so I can see properly. There we go. Oh, perfect. Um, so the, yeah, basically the criteria. So we're not, um, I suppose I, I did slip up a little bit. I think when I initially said ranking, when we go to the dashboard, we order. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was, that was a real slip up. But essentially what we do is we pull in data from Crossref and Open Alex, uh, Unpaywall and uh, the research organization registry. Um, and we've just, um, uh, in terms of criteria, I think we've, for countries, we've just said, as long as there's five research outputs tied to a particular country, which is, you know, um, why we've got 225 countries. Um, for institutions, um, we've just set the criteria that an institution has to have at least 50 research outputs coming from these data sets to display on the dashboard. So that's the only criteria that we sort of have for, you know, inclusion within the data set. We then do do some filtering in terms of, you know, what we call a research output based on the crossref um, identifiers and the crossref types that come through the system. But we try to include as much um, data as possible. So it does. Uh, there is an order, I suppose, um, as you look at the countries sort of and the institutions on the website here. So we've just our default ordering is by the open access percentage, um, but you can sit there and change the order if you like as well through the dashboard but we've tried to include as many countries as possible as long as they have five research outputs that are indexed in crossref is the only other is one of the other caveats that we have but it's ordering by i mean the yeah. original idea uh, it's a it's a great question and Catherine, you can hear we're still a bit anxious about the word ranking, ranking. <laughs> because uh, right through the whole koki project there has been a lot of 
yeah, a lot of tension because really we we don't like the idea of university rankings. We think they're oversimplistic. There's lots that's wrong with them. Uh, but when it comes to making information sort of easy to navigate and drawing attention to a key aspect of performance or the rate, the proportion of publications that, for example, are open access, um, it's very hard not to build something that is is kind of like a ranking. So this is this is a dashboard that's focused on openness and the bigger pokey data sets, I, I think that's the other really interesting challenge. It's not a challenge, it's it's an amazing moment in the possibilities of big linked open data. So we could now really I think build a dashboard that was focused on almost any aspect of scholarly communication, uh, including citation diversity, for example. We've done, like Carl has done some amazing research looking at the diversity as a measure of citation performance. We've got, you know, projects that are relating to gender. There's all sorts of interesting things we can see in the data. And this dashboard is just intended to bring attention to open access. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for that for that clarification. It 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 and it really does look like a ranking, and unfortunately, when it when it when it comes up, you know, yeah, yeah, but but, but yeah, that that was also one of the things that we learned when we um when we really began speaking to um, librarians and decision makers in universities when we started asking them what they needed, you know, what would support them in their efforts to make universities more open or what were the tools that were missing from their toolkit, um, you know, really they they were quite clear, some of them, many of them, that actually information that was more or less a ranking that allowed them to make comparisons, that allowed them to understand their institution's performance relative to institutions like them, that ability to kind of place themselves within a landscape uh, was something that came back as really important um, and actually caused us to come back after our Mauritius workshop, really, um, really thinking about, about what it was that, that we would, you know, try and build because initially we were going to do something totally different. It was not this, <laughs> it was something else. Yeah. I mean, okay, there's another question in the in the chat by Joe, but before I go on to that, whilst we're on ranking, just a quick one. Are you aware if your system affects the actual university rankings out there? So the data that we use is used in the um open or it was it's it we're using data sources that are being used in the open Leiden ranking, for example. Um, and I think beyond that, I'm not aware that Times Higher Education uh, or QS are paying a lot of attention to, to the Koki uh, dashboard. But the data sources that we are drawing from and using are definitely, I think, becoming more common within a lot of the work that's going on in the research evaluation space. So the Barcelona Declaration uh, on Open Research Information is something that this group might have heard of that was released late last year. And uh, there are a lot of institutions and research groups and countries that have, that are starting to sort of sign up to using open alternatives to Scopus Web of Science and closed databases when it comes to research evaluation. So I don't think anyone is necessarily pulling from the Koki dashboard or this particular dashboard, but I think that it is now um, it's now a really good time to be paying attention to the data sources that we're using and thinking about the role that open research information and more transparent approaches to research evaluation are going to play in research evaluation and ranking in the future. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, okay, so moving on to Joe's question, she says, thank you so much for the great presentation. Could you talk a bit more about the data sources? 
Africa Archive works with data site digital object identifiers now through Ubuntu Net Alliance on DSpace. How can we capture those into the dashboard or are there more workflows we can set up to integrate with each other's systems? She goes on to say, are there ways to capture research items that are listed in institutional repositories and not assigning digital object identifiers? Looking at the institutional listing in the dashboard highlighting archives. Ah, good questions. The data site um, DOIs, yes, that is that is a question that we have been getting uh, for quite some time. And it is on, I guess, our technical roadmap. We would like to support them. Sort of in the past, it has been a little bit of a technical uh, constraint to try and work with the data site uh, data site DOIs at scale. Um, but the we've made our uh, the code that drives this dashboard is completely open source, um, as other workflows um, that you know um, pull the data through um, and process it. And we would love to honestly uh, have anyone collaborate and build upon the workflows that we've built because we think that's you know a really fantastic way to expand the the ecosystem and to actually you know get more. Um, you know, get more work into the dashboard and into, you know, developing some of the workflows for, um, you know, new features like this that would actually, you know, significantly improve coverage, particularly of uh, African research outputs. Um, so, yeah, it it just takes time and technical capacity and funding um, is probably the biggest thing and maybe the, one of the biggest hurdles that we, you know, we all have. Um, but... Yeah, we if there's or just would definitely like to put the call out there. I can send out you know, um, links to where our repositories are and our contact details. Um, but it would be really be fantastic to have you know other software developers and and coders contributing to the workflows. We just you know one of our ecosystems interoperable. Um, that's the the core aim really at the end of the day, and to discuss more about what we can do to you know support our research in Africa, particularly with expanding coverage and data site. Okay, uh, Joe, does that answer your question? I think we need to catch up again, Joe. Yes, absolutely. And we talked about this also a while ago. I thought I just thought yeah. um, bring up the question again. because time No, no, back. it's nice to be reminded <laughs> because time flies by very quickly. Yeah. But could you go back to the archive section and in institutional mm. view? Um, Look, any particular university? It's just so this one's here. ICT is always a good one. So, so institution repositories. Yeah. So so what right. what is that now reflecting practically? This is uh, some information that we've got uh, coming through um, from on payable, so we can uh, take a look at um, where open. Um, uh, uh, where the outputs um, that are we've tagged other platform are located. So institutional repositories. With this isn't this coverage isn't perfect, and we um, we wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, so some of these we suspect that the data here possibly can be can be improved, but it does give a bit of an indication about where um, you can find um, these research outputs um, from different institutions in different countries. So they're located on PubMed yeah. um, with institutional repositories. So one of the caveats um, of the institutional repositories, for example, here is if um, they are behind a firewall, they won't show up. Um, so um, they do have to be publicly available as well. Some institutional repositories require you to log in via the institution's website with your staff or student ID to actually see things. So you will, I'm just trying to remember if there's a, um ooh, if I can find a institution off the top of my head that doesn't have here we go um so this one doesn't actually have an institutional repository linked to it and it might be because it may not have one um mm. we haven't linked it correctly it's not indexed by unpayable or it's been um it's behind a firewall so it can't be indexed via these open data sets um so we've actually created a form here um where you can um, submit that to us and say, oh, hey, I'm at this institution. Um, I know we've got an institutional repository. Can you please take a look and see why you, you may not be picking it up? Yeah, this right. is where the, this is really where like the local expertise comes through mm -hmm. because we've now got 50,000 institutions on the dashboard. We're not manually reviewing right. every single one of them. Yeah. Maybe that's something we can look into together um, in kind of mediating the process of, you know, for, for the region also with other actors here to, to use the, 
like the capture means that you've set up like the this form to mm -hmm. decide and also to to populate further so that we can add more more content and sources brilliant cool yeah uh, um we have we have one more question in the question and answer section from Chimunya Chamwe. Uh, does your system filter out of predatory journals? Ah, so so I I was looking at that thinking, wow, that's a really tricky question. So we do not filter um, predatory journals, but we pull from uh, from data sources. Uh, including Crossref um, and who have we got? Crossref and Open Alex and um, Paywall, mm. um, which I'm not sure what they're doing about predatory journals. Well, I would still think they'd be identified. So yeah. yeah, no. So we do we do do a filter. I was sort of come to through, but it's not for predatory journals. So if there's a DOI that is indexed in Crossref, mm. um, then we and it's it's tagged as a research output. Then it is something that we pull through that we pull through the system. Um, we've got for the data nerds uh, amongst us, we've got a lot of detail on the how it works page. So talking about the sources that we link to, how we link them all together, how we filter them. So one thing that we did do is we um, did make a call to filter the publications based on their cross-ref metadata type. So we include journal articles, preceding articles, reports, posted content, edited books, books, book chapters, parts of books, reference books, monographs, reference entries. Um, but some things that we do exclude are data sets, databases, components, report components, peer reviews, grants, proceedings, journal issues, report series, and book tracks and null pipes as well. Um, I'd, yeah, be keen to get um, yeah, Cameron or Carl's thoughts on this. Well, actually. I think, yeah, yeah, because I think it's really tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been critiques, for example, you know, that the, the endless problem is identifying predatory journals without in it like accidentally excluding very legitimate publishers and I think that's something that the directory of open access journals do a lot of work on mm. however uh, all of those those reference points have got potential unintended consequences when it comes to um to watch what who's excluded really yeah. um so I think yeah I think that's a really interesting question um and and I guess that's also another reason that that it makes sense to be accepting that this dashboard is really looking at trends in openness. And if yeah, I don't know. I'd be really interested to hear some more on that. Is it a problem? Should we be um, looking to filter for predatory journals? And if we did, I would actually be very interested to see whether or not it changed anything. Um, in, in relation to the rates of open access. Mm. Yeah, we actually have a very uh, interesting comment here from Eva Mendes who says, what a good question. First, we should agree upon what are predatory journals, quote unquote, yeah. only the fraudulent journals. For me, all the publishers are, are predatory, <laughs> but not all fraudulent, which is a yeah. good point to make, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and... Uh, Forgive me if I butcher the name, but Sapphire Shah asks, what are the challenges you face with regards to gender diversity and how can we or the community help? For example, providing knowledge that certain names are predominantly given to cis females in certain countries or cultures. Again, uh, I love that question. That is an absolutely fantastic question. Um, and the, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was at a conference a few years ago before COVID uh, and the theme was bibliodiversity. And we had what I like to think of as an almost riot over whether or not ORCID allows people to self-identify gender, for example. And if it doesn't, then I, I think, as far as I'm aware, um, at the moment, the, the strategy used to identify gender and publication has to be reverse engineering uh, gender from name, which or 
uh, coming up with other creative strategies like scraping institutional web websites for pronouns or something else. But it's a real, it's a real, you know, it's a proper challenge. I think um, we have a project at the moment that we're about to kick off with the University of Aberdeen. And for that project, we're looking, we're using HR records for universities to explore gender diversity at one institution. Um, and then beyond that, our work has relied on um, sort of trends, national trends or institution level data that relates to gender and um, employment patterns, for example. But the Koki project so far, as far as I'm aware, no one has, none of us have attempted to do any kind of reverse um, no. engineering or backing out gender from names because I think we've all got real concerns with that as a methodology, including because it doesn't, you know, handle cultural or linguistic diversity at all well. So in terms of what the community can do, I would love a, a nice registry as, a, as a, you know, someone who identifies as Female, I'd love to be able to put my preferred gender on my orchid, but um, but I've been told that that's not something that orchid would ever support. Um, so I don't know. I think that I would love to hear what the answer to all of that is. Yeah, I mean, with also with the interest of time, we have about two minutes left. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Just two questions quickly. The first yeah. one is if your aim is not specifically to have a ranking, so to speak, what is it that this listing is meant to produce? And is there any use case in which it has produced that intended impact? And also apart from that question, how do you explain in your own words or in your own perspective, the lower, the lower views, for example, from the African region? The, in terms of uh, the number of people looking at the website or, and looking, exploring this, uh, well, I, I mean, I think it's, for me, this site or this dashboard is a really fantastic example of the limitations that we have had as a project team and some of um, the realities of, of working with incredibly big data sets. So when uh, we started the Koki project, we we had no way of really, I think, understanding the level or the scale of international granularity that would be possible when we started knitting together these really big data sets and figuring out what we as a small, well, relatively small project team do when our engineering creates something um, that is providing a lot of detail about countries and institutions in every country on the planet. And that is something that we, you know, I don't think we're fully prepared for. So one of the reasons I'm sure we had relatively low levels of access to the dashboard from Africa related to the fact that uh, we gave a lot of thought to how we could include diverse voices in the process of thinking about the principles we might use in beginning our project and designing a tool. But then we got to the other end of that and it was sort of a technical project and we got busy and we didn't have enough time and we don't have a marketing team. And we just truly forgot to do the messaging to the communities who might then use the dashboard or the tool. So that was I think not only us failing to go back and to complete the circle as a team, I also think there's a bigger lesson in that experience for us about what happens when relatively small project teams collide with really big, rich, complex international data sets and what we might need to think about as a community when it comes to um, to figuring out how we work together uh, so that, yeah, so that the deep technical expertise that we might have over here can actually be um, useful to other communities who might have a real interest in what we're doing and what we're building. So I think that for me, it's a proper challenge of really big data. Um, and then in terms of what we hoped uh, to build or what we thought we would see, um, I think... 
I think that we really, with this project, were interested in finding out. So, so this was a, it's in addition to being the product of um, a moment of frustration where we realised that, you know, what, what leaders were being offered was only a tiny part of the information that they could have access to. Uh, there is a real curiosity. We don't know what we're going to see before we build these dashboards and before we start looking at these data sets. So I don't think we had a single use case in mind. This is genuinely like when this was generated and I saw it every time we look at this, we're like, wow, hey, look, you know, those guys are up the top. I didn't expect to see that. We click through, we can see really interesting patterns that we we truly weren't expecting to see before we could start exploring this information in a way that's visual. So the use case for me is the ability to invite others into a conversation about, I guess, you know, for example, we can see particular patterns in Latin America, or we might be able to see when we start exploring this dashboard that um, that there are certain data sources that are always missing. So as a community, once we can start seeing those things, we can perhaps begin having different conversations about the infrastructures that we might want to work on together or the interventions or the policies that are resulting in certain types of patterns. So for me, the use case of this dashboard is really the demonstrator of, hey, you know, the world has changed. Uh, the open research information landscape now, these data sources are big, they're powerful, we can do things in a different way, we have new ways of exploring the world. Um, and then really, I think we're at the beginning of a journey of trying to figure out what that really means. Wow. Well, unfortunately, we have we have run out of time. I don't even think the the one the one hour was enough because it's such a rich conversation, and I think there's actually uh, more questions in the in in the question and answers. But I think um, we will have to we will have to catch up on this conversation later on. I think uh, yeah, you can go ahead and answer, Lucy. Sorry, <laughs> she's playing buttons. I didn't. I don't know how to do that. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I just pushed a button. I was only going to say, if you want to help us with the marketing problem, it would be great. Just please tweet or share the link. Invite your colleagues to come and take a look at the dashboard and to begin exploring the data. And um, also to get in touch with us because we have a real team here. We're real humans behind this dashboard that are um, excited when people get in touch. So, um, you know, so just talking about the fact that this exists and helping us to to get the link out is really helpful. And then also getting in touch if you have questions or feedback is a really useful thing for us also. Yeah, I mean, these days, there's so many ways to, to get in touch. There's LinkedIn. I think both of you are on LinkedIn, actually. So that's one way you can get in touch with, with, the, with the project. But with that being said, allow me to thank you, um, Prof. Lucy and Dr. Catherine, for a wonderful presentation on what the Koki Project is doing and how it is uh, impacting open science um, world, for lack of a better word, and how it, it, we can be able to help going forward. Uh, this has been such an engaging webinar. Thank you to everybody who has attended. Thank you for the questions. and. Um, Thank you for making the time. So if you look in the chat, resources have been shared on uh, the webinar series itself. Uh, it is a continuous series. We will have the the next webinar. Uh, when is the next webinar going to be, Ebuka? Can you just put that in the chat as well? Yes, um, it's already in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's information about the next webinar. The recordings will be shared on YouTube as well. Uh, and uh, the Ubuntu Netherlands uh, YouTube channel also has a playlist on the on the webinar series itself. It's called Ubuntu Net TV. Please subscribe, uh, go, and, go and check it out. We'll post it and you can come back to it. Uh, with that being said, thank you everyone for making the time and we hope to see you in the next webinar. Please plan to attend. Thank you. Thank you.